101 is a slang term for the most basic knowledge in some subject. 101, like our podcast. This is Venezuela 101. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Venezuela 101. I am Miguel Pizarro. And I'm Melanio Escobar. In this podcast, we will interview different experts to discuss the main political, economical, and social issues in Venezuela with intention of having a broader and deeper understanding of the crisis that our country is going through today. But first, before introducing the topic we will address today and our first guest, we would like to invite you to listen to the trailer that we have published last week, which is available on this platform. If you haven't already done that, you will be able to listen to some of the topics that we will speak about from now on every two weeks and a little bit more about the foundations of this podcast. Well, now to get into the subject, the first issue we wanted to address in Venezuela 101 is human rights violation. Reports from the UN Human Rights Council, the International Criminal Court, the fact-finding mission, as well as organizations and activists have continuously denounced that systematic violations of human rights by the Nicolás Maduro regime in Venezuela. Political, economic, and social rights are being violated daily, and the victims have nowhere to turn to justice or reparation. To explain more about this issue today, we're being joined by Tamara Tarasuk. Tamara is a lawyer, and she's currently the deputy director of the America's Division of Human Rights Watch. She began working there as a fellow in 2005. She covered Mexico and Venezuela for Human Rights Watch and worked on several countries in the region as senior researcher. Prior to this, she also coordinated a project on citizen security in Latin America for the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She also worked at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights of Organization of American States. Welcome to Venezuela 101, Tamara. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here talking to you about Venezuela. Tamara, it is a pleasure for us to have you here. As Miguel mentioned, the human rights situation in Venezuela has been on the table for many years now. Human Rights Watch has also been one of the organizations that has worked to inform on the crisis and making it more visible. In your experience, is there any moment that you consider has marked a turning point for the international community to place an emphasis towards Venezuela? Human Rights Watch has covered the situation in Venezuela for decades now. And it is true that a while back, it was a challenge because we had to convince the people that the situation in Venezuela was really bad. Um, I think... One of the turning points was the repression in 2014. At the time when we started documenting the incidents of arbitrary arrests and torture, there was still this idea that, you know, it was a bit of an exaggeration from Venezuelans. Uh, and, you know, given that Venezuela is the country where soap operas come from. Um, but the truth is that as we started exposing the details of cases and the brutal torture, and as it usually happens, you know, people get killed killed on the streets and they make headlines. Um, so I would say that that repression was a turning point. The repression in 2017 as well. And, you know, it was then a matter of putting together all the facts and talking about, you know, repression on the streets, the detention and political disqualification of opposition leaders, and how that eventually turned into a much broader crackdown on dissent. Um, and, you know, we ended up talking about abuses not only committed about against protesters or against people um, with political opposition, but actually it ended up including doctors or journalists or human rights defenders. Um, and that is what started to make international headlines and make people pay attention. I would say that the challenge today is the opposite, right? It's been, Minnesota is a country that faces three simultaneous crises. Um, there's still a crackdown on dissent. There's a humanitarian emergency. There's a consequent refugee crisis in the region. And today, 
we are struggling to get the international attention to care and pay attention because we are looking at a country where everyone knows all of these human rights problems are happening. And, you know, as I said, now the challenge is how do we get the international community to turn their eyes to Venezuela when everyone knows that all of this is happening. And in fact, authorities are making a concerted effort to show that the reality is much better than what is actually happening on the ground. Normally, when we talk about human rights violation in Venezuela, it is mainly related to political rights, arrest, prosecutions, harassment, torture. However, there are also economical, social, reproductive, and even environmental rights that are being violated on a daily basis in Venezuela. Is there any data that you have compiled that allow us to understand that it's not only about political prisoners or people being prosecuted or tortured, but that this affects the entire population without any kind of political or geographical distinction? I think this is a very important point. Um, we can't think about Venezuela just as a country where there is political persecution or the violation of political rights. One of the main problems in the country is today the humanitarian emergency. Um, we did research with health professionals and public health specialists to be able to document how bad the situation was on the ground. And what we found is that there are millions of people that are having trouble to access basic health care and adequate nutrition. This um, is not a theoretical academic discussion. You know, after a lot of um, pressure from uh, different actors, the World Food Program was able to deploy in Venezuela. And their estimation is that one in three Venezuelans is food insecure and needs assistance. Um, this um, goes hand in hand with data from local organizations that found high levels of child malnutrition And child malnutrition has a direct impact in the development of children who will have a harder time um, su being successful in life because of the impact of um, stunting and child malnutrition in their early years. The health uh, troubles are affecting a range of different Venezuelans. We've documented, for example, how Women in Venezuela have a hard time accessing preventive services to uh, prevent breast cancer. You know, this is something that in other parts of the world does not lead to uh, women's deaths, but in Venezuela is an important uh, challenge. Um, and, you know, this is very clear in certain areas of the country, like, for example, the South, where there is illegal gold mining, um, and communities in these areas are not only subjected to horrible abuses by illegal armed groups that control the gold mines in the South of the country, but they're also exposed to poor health environment and conditions that have generated very, very high levels of malaria, for example, where access to treatment and prevention mechanisms are very limited. So, you know, when we talk about the humanitarian situation in Venezuela, it's not just the data and, you know, sharing that a very high percentage of hospitals in Venezuela, for example, don't have access to water but also explaining how that has an impact on people's lives. Because if you're a doctor and you work in a hospital without running water or with intermittent running water, then the consequence is that you can't wash your hand between seeing one patient and the other, and that just exponentially increases the chances of transmitting diseases. And as I said, you know, why, as you introduced me, Um, a few minutes ago, I'm a lawyer, but precisely to be able to speak to the health community and the public health sector, we did this research with 
doctors and public health specialists. And the conclusion that Venezuela is facing a dire, complex humanitarian emergency, which is a technical term that requires um, strong international action, um, is one coined by these experts and not by lawyers. Tamara, what can you tell us about the mechanisms such as the fact-finding mission or the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights? We know that the renewal of the mission's mandate will be defined at the next session of the Human Rights Council. Do you think it is important that the mandate is renewed? Do you think that both the fact-finding mission and Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights reports and statement have generated any impact or progress regarding this situation? The reason why these international mechanisms are important is because today in Venezuela, victims of abuse and their families have absolutely no chance to have access to justice and to see perpetrators brought to justice inside Venezuela. And, you know, that's why we've worked very hard to push for international accountability. Part of this has been sending information to the prosecutor's office at the International Criminal Court, which you know, late last year decided to open the first investigation into possible crimes against humanity in Latin America. That was a huge step because the prosecutor's office and the International Criminal Court can actually investigate individual criminal responsibility and not just state responsibility as other international monitors can determine. The fact-finding mission has been instrumental in pushing for conditions prior to the decision of the ICC prosecutor's um, investigation. They've released two groundbreaking reports, one providing evidence of crimes against humanity, another establishing that Venezuela's judiciary was complicit in the abuses. And, you know, we fully support the renewal of the fact-finding mission as a key mechanism to push for international accountability. The Office of the High Commissioner has also played an important role with a series of reports that acknowledge human rights violations committed in Venezuela. And You know, I think it's important to multiply these voices expressing concern about what is happening in Venezuela. There has been some concern about whether the presence of the High Commissioner in Venezuela is um, was provided at the expense of the High Commissioner's um, public statements expressing concern about what is happening in the country. And that's a problem, right? Because um, the High Commissioner's role is to side with the victims and ensure that there is a clear condemnation of abuses, regardless of whether access is or isn't provided. What has been the response of the regime to each report, to each recommendation, to each accusation, Tamara? We hear, for example, that sometimes they claim to collaborate with the High Commissioner of Human Rights Office. But what does this cooperation really mean? Because there seems to be no willingness at all from their part, I mean from the regime part, to provide justice or reparation to any of the, of the victims, not even to open fair trials or a normal judicial process for them. The typical response by the regime to critical reporting by um, human rights monitors is just saying it's a lie or attacking the messenger. Um, the attempts to collaborate with the High Commissioner or certain uh, UN offices um, is not genuine cooperation, to say the least. They are cooperating with those that they know will be less critical or not critical of what is actually happening in the country. I mean, it's not surprising that they haven't allowed a UN rapporteur on freedom of expression or to protect human rights defenders um, or a working group on arbitrary detentions to actually enter the country. They haven't allowed the UN fact-finding mission to visit Venezuela to do their research. 
Um, and that is precisely because this is a um, false attempt to try to show that Venezuela is uh, changing paths and moving towards being a country that can belong to the international community. And in this context, it's critical to set the bar high and to ensure that the message by like-minded governments and by all of us who are concerned by about democracy and human rights in Venezuela is consistently that, you know, these fake gains won't really do the trick. Finally, Tamara, what do you think has been the role of the NGOs, the activists, the civil society, and even of the victims in generating some kind of change between the status quo in the context of the systematic violation of human rights by the Venezuelan regime? How can we make more pressure to generate any positive outcomes? I admire the work of Venezuelan human rights defenders and independent journalists who, you know, even in the face of threats and a very hostile environment, have continued to bravely do their jobs and expose the reality in Venezuela, what is happening in hospitals, in detention centers, in the abuses that are being committed by security forces, the corruption. And all of this is accompanied by victims of abuse and their families who dare to stand up. And, you know, these are the people that need all the support they can get. You know, we can't allow a situation in which their options are silence inside Venezuela or exile. We need to ensure that we can support their brave efforts to continue exposing the reality in the country without suffering consequences or putting them themselves at risk. From everything that Tamara has said, I would like to highlight the importance of amplifying the voice of those who show their concern about what is happening in Venezuela in order to continue calling the attention of international community and the justice mechanism as well as the importance of giving a voice to the millions of victims of human rights violations which are committed daily. And I say millions because inside of a country, as you mentioned, Tamara, there is a basic issue that is underlying above all the conditions, and that is the complex humanitarian emergency, which today, according to the UN numbers, affects more than 7 million people on, in Venezuela. For me and for us, this is an essential, and it's really important to increase all the pressure through this accountability mechanism renew the mandates, like the fact-finding mission mandate later in September in the Human Rights Council, and listen to the testimony of all the victims, because that is what will allow justice and reparation for all and everyone inside of the country. What do you think, Melanie? Yes, and I agree with you, Miguel. And I also want to say that I share with Tamara the admiration that she mentioned for the NGOs, my colleagues, the doctors, the humanitarian workers in the country, and who are still there denouncing daily, subject to censorship, self-censorship, intimidation, putting their lives and their families' lives at risk in order to make visible everything that is happening in our country. And I also want to highlight the work of those like us who are exiled after being victims of that persecution, but who continue to seek always to support those who remain on the ground and to show the world the true face of the regime. And with this, we end today's podcast. Thank you, Tamara, for joining us today. Thank you for your time and for your efforts and for all the extraordinary work that you and Human Rights Watch are doing for Venezuela and in general for the human rights situation all over the world. You have our deepest appreciation. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to have the opportunity to talk about all of this. Um, Venezuela is a country I care deeply about. And, you know, it's important to continue finding opportunities to talk about what is happening there. You know, it, it's our job to ensure that people continue to care and pay attention. Thank you so much, Tamara. This was the first episode of Venezuela 101. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it, spread the word with your colleagues, family, and friends. Follow us in our social media and leave us a comment at Miguel underscore Pizarro at Melanio Bar. And don't forget to share this content. A new guest is going to be with us every two weeks on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor FM, and YouTube.